are coming. We have a small, intimate group today, but I wanted to introduce the series and our speakers today. So my name is Kimberly, and I'm one of the reference librarians here at Seattle Central College. We post this every week because we believe in creating a space where folks can come and talk about issues that they are passionate about in a safe, respectful environment. So we have faculty, staff, students, and community members come in and host these sessions. And currently planning for fall quarter already. Um, and if you are passionate about a topic, then talk to me or Kelly um, about setting up the time to come speak to our students uh, and our community. So I've put some resources on the board. So there's a lot of different books that you can check out from our collection. If you're interested in learning more about anything you hear about today, you can obviously talk to our speaker or talk to me about finding resources in our online and print collections. So we'd like this to be a conversation that is respectful, um, and whether or not you approve every single thing you hear today, I ask that everyone respect it. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Ruth Harold, who is the Executive Director of the Elizabeth Gregory Home, which is a home for homeless and transitioning women, um, and at-risk women, and Michelle Nobles, who is familiar with the Elizabeth Gregory Home, and just recently became a member of the Transition House. Sure. So, um, thank you, Kimberly, for the introduction. And I, I'm, as she mentioned, I'm the executive director of Elizabeth Gregory Home, and I've been there about three and a half years. And um, because this isn't just a talk about Elizabeth Gregory Home, more about the broader issue of homelessness, I'm going to talk, you know, some from the perspective of what we offer, but also from the perspective of what's going on in the community with homelessness. And Michelle's going to speak to her journey with homelessness. And so she is currently, she just as she just mentioned, we, we actually have a drop-in day center in the university district. And one of the things that's unique about it, there's several things that are unique about our drop-in day center. One is that uh, we're one of the few places where people can rest. And so we give people mats and we have reclining chairs because we know our belief is if somebody's exhausted uh, because they've been on the streets or they've been in a shelter, um, Homeless, many of the homeless folks that we work with are very tired all the time. And so, um, so we know that they need to, I look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and until you meet that, that bottom level of the hierarchy, which is physical needs, <coughs> and, you know, um, a lot of folks in our community say, why aren't people who are homeless getting jobs? Why aren't people who are homeless going to school? Why aren't people, and that's, that's way up there on that hierarchy of needs. And so if you are down here at that level, where you, your physical needs, your food, your shelter, your safety, which is the next layer up, if those needs aren't being met, then you cannot jump ahead. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle will endorse this, but my observation in the three, hour, three and a half years of working with homeless people is being homeless is hard work. It is a full-time job. And, and what I would like to see, and one of the reasons I think it's important to have conversations like this today is how do we you know, provide services and, and look at it as a community to make that job less arduous and to um, look at the dignity and humanity of each, each person that's homeless out there. Um, so so there's, we have, um, there's been an initiative, a 10-year initiative, that was actually managed by the King County, by combined governments as well as United Way, and it was called the 10-Year Plan to End Homelessness. And it was a very ambitious plan that did not work. And so now there, it's that, that period of time, that 10 years, so, no. um, and, and so now they're looking at, like, okay, retool, what are we going to do? And one of the ways that they measure whether or not that plan works is every year there is a one-night count in January, which happened again this year. And so 2015, the, the statistics, and you, know, you can always look this up, all you have to do is Google one-night count. And the statistics were that this year, their street camp was 10,047 people that they accounted for that were homeless on that one night. Now of that 10,000 people, um, they also consider anybody in transitional housing <coughs> or shelters as also homeless. And so there were 2,993 people in transitional housing, 3,282 people in shelters, but 3,772 people that they counted on the street. That was a 21% increase of the total number from the previous year. And so not only did, did the 10-year-old the year plan not work, but the problem continues to escalate. 
So when I look at my role, I have this privilege of working in this, this arena with a homeless woman and at risk. And so I like to emphasize that because our mission is, um, is actually to provide a welcoming and respectful refuge where homeless and at risk women have access to compassionate care. And I think we, we believe, and that's the home of Elizabeth Gregory Paul, because we really believe if we can help somebody not get to the place that they're homeless, uh, that, that's a win. If we can help people who are homeless, that's a win. And, and just as importantly, once somebody gets housed, that is not the end of their issues, their problems. That's, that's sometimes the beginning. Because, you know, and I think that that's where there's no simple fix. And I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about that. But it's not a, it's a very complex problem. And just getting somebody into permanent housing um, does not fix all the issues they have. So what we tell folks, and Michelle can speak to this because she literally just came in last week to our transitional house. And we contract with folks and we tell them that one of the things that, that, that they're signing on for is after they can stay transitional housing as it's defined in, in at least in our geographic area, is up to two years. And we have a beautiful house for eight women that's in North Seattle, Northeast Seattle. And, uh, but one of the things they signed on for is that they will, they will continue to follow up with us for a minimum of one time a month after they leave our program. And you know, we work very intensively. They also signed up for you know, what kinds of goals that they want to work on in the program. And the, two of those goals have to be some sort of source of income. Because if you don't have any source of income, then you're not going to find yourself in a sustainable situation. Um, and then the other piece of it is uh, that they have to be willing to really you know, look at what the next step is going to be for housing. Uh, we just had a woman who, um, who left our program and just a little over a week ago, and she won, there's lotteries, there's so many things I could talk about, but there's lotteries um, to be able to get into a lot of the, the housing um, programs. And this particular one that she got into is managed by, <coughs> by uh, Low Income Housing Institute. And um, it's considered affordable housing. Now she works in a, essentially a minimum wage job. And that affordable housing, she told me when I, I took her to her place to take her some of the you know, belongings that she needed, and it's $715 a month, which is 50% of her income. And I'm like, wow, that's, and it is, it's a beautiful, it's a brand new building, it's a brand new small studio, but it's lovely. And, uh, and I was thinking like, and that doesn't include her utilities. And so I'm thinking, wow, we really have, we live in a geographic area that's very, very costly. So what, what we talked to folks about, so she knows that she's going to continue to come back to Elizabeth Gregory Home, which our day center, where we provide uh, for anyone who identifies as a woman. And so one of the things that we are very focused on is we are a very safe place. We want that to be a safe place for anyone who identifies as a woman. And so we've become a safe haven for trans women um, who particularly are early on in their transition, which is usually where they find themselves often, you know, often it's in that early <coughs> transition where they may find themselves homeless. And uh, so we've been working very carefully with the Pride Foundation <coughs> to expand the services that we can provide to those women and to really work on and focus on how we can be an inclusive environment. Uh, one of ours, we did a strategic planning over the last year, which was really exciting, and, and we looked at uh, our redefining our values, and the very first one is inclusion, and accepting and celebrating difference. The other one is respect, honoring individuality, empathy, listening with compassion and understanding, and community, which is to help people engender a sense of belonging. And so those are some of the core values that we carry into every service and program that we offer at Elizabeth Gregory. <coughs> uh, one of the things that I've learned uh, that I'd like to share is there is no step, whatever you think uh, homelessness looks like, it, that's not it. I'm, that's what I'm here to tell you. It is so widely varied. And so people, because people have an, I, I had ideas. You know, I had ideas. And somebody had even mentioned, like, people that you see on the street. Well, that is there, is, there are some folks that experience chronic homelessness. And so we have folks that, that go this range of people who grew up in poverty frequently, who are undereducated or poorly educated, some immigrant. Uh, we have people who are chronically mentally ill. We have some people who are chemically dependent and have been struggling with addiction for, for a number of years, <laughs> besides the coffee. But, um, uh, yeah, uh, but, but we have folks that, um, and then we have folks, we, we call it, we almost can tell when people come into our day center, we say it's called, we call it the deer in the headlight, where somebody who never dreamed that they would ever end up being homeless, 
um, ended up being homeless because of circumstances beyond their control. And sometimes that is where, you know, um, I have one woman um, who actually donated, you know, a beautiful, she's created a business for herself, but I asked her, you know, why she felt drawn. She, she has a business where she donated these beautiful bags that, she's, that she sells, kind of like a home party kind of thing, but she's very successful with it. And she said, well, I really wanted to give back. And then she said, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, but, you know, I came from a wealthy background, and I was married to someone from my, who was from Microsoft. We had a very fine life. We got divorced. And I thought just getting the house in the divorce was really a great thing until I realized that I hadn't worked in 17 years and that I had no skills. And, and so it got to the point where I couldn't afford gas for this really nice vehicle that I also got through the divorce. And, um, and here I was, sort of a prisoner in my home, waiting to find out if I was going to lose my home. And so she said, you know, she found out that there were resources. She didn't come to Elizabeth Gregory home for that, but she wanted to give back to an agency that did support people who found themselves in situations that they never dreamed that they would find themselves in. So there's that, that's the range of people that we work with who are homeless. One of the things that's unique about Elizabeth Gregory Home is we're in the university district, um, you know, kind of off the beaten track a little bit. We're up on 16th and a bit in the lower level of a, a University of Lutheran Church, which who founded it back in 2001. Uh, and then we started services back in 2006. But, you know, what our women tell us again and again is, you know, there's the concentration of services are in the heart of downtown. And that, that is just, that's a fact, right? And also in the heart of downtown, when they're not in those service systems, are a lot, there's a lot of peril, you know, whether, you know, regardless of what women's you know, walks of life are. And so women's face, <coughs> face some specific peril around um, trafficking, human trafficking. Everybody who's down in the downtown core who's homeless faces the drug trafficking issues that happen and um, assault, and so we hear some pretty pretty challenging stories. And so we do provide, you know, they actually were the only day center of our sort north of the Ship Canal. So um, so we do provide a niche, you know, when I talked about that Maslow's hierarchy of need, that really is that safety need. And so people come and say, I can just breathe again. I can just breathe again. And then, and then we, um, with Low Income Housing Institute, we actually contract the house that Michelle just moved into. Um, which is up just a little north of that in a neighborhood. And it's a beautiful house, and uh, eight women live there, and they live there for up to, to two, two years, as I mentioned. So, um, so we part of our strategic plan was coming up with some core strategies, and so to achieve our mission, we focus our expertise, resources, and activities towards the establishment of several conditions. And I'm not going to go over all four of those, but one of them is to build a solid support fund structure aimed at connecting homeless women with information resources and supportive relationships. So, um, so one of the things that we do, we decided to do this last year, 2014, every woman who comes through our door, um, and last year we saw 610 women, and we are about uh, 1,800 square foot a, um, actually, we weren't even that. We were 950 square feet. We doubled our space in 2014. We're a small center, um, but we see a lot of women, and we do so very efficiently. And that was 610 women, excuse me, for a total of 8,440 visits. And so we, we see a lot of people. And we decided we would see every person because we wanted to, we couldn't meet that because some people come in and for a variety of reasons, you know, one, <laughs> trying to see if you have a, a new day, a day where 47 new women happen to walk in that particular day. We don't have the staffing to be able to, to see 47 people that day. But we did see about 400, mm -hmm. that's 610 women last year. And one of the things that our goal was, look somebody in the eye and be able to say to them, you know, besides getting some information, what kind of resources do you need? But it is, what, what are your hopes and dreams? Because what, what we discovered is, when we start asking that question, is people do this. Like, well, you know, I don't think about that. But, you know, part of the human condition is being in touch with what your hopes and dreams are. You know, and then out of that can come a simple measurable goal. And for some of our groups, <coughs> their, their hope and dream is, you know, some people, I think some people are homeless and some people, there are some people who, are, who, will, who identify themselves as essentially home free. And they're sort of like, you know what, this is my lifestyle. And this is where I want to be right now. And we're okay, all right. And so how can we be of service and support to you? That is not the majority of people, I'm here to tell you. Most people do not want to be homeless, and they are looking for that next 
way to get that next step out. So we do that in many different ways. Um, we tell folks, dream big. You don't dream, you know, you can't get there. And so, you know, we're helping folks who may have come from a lifetime of hopelessness to, you know, finding one kernel of hope and how can we help support them. So that's the idealistic dream, and we're not going to lose that. You know, it's easy to, because funding world, it's kind of hard, you know, and we're building this agency one little brick at a time. And in fact, we, I, we've almost completed, I've almost, I'm not saying I, but we have almost completed a capital campaign where we're going to add the only thing we cannot meet as an essential need, because we let people rest. We're the only day center allows people to cook their own food, so mm -hmm. we're culturally sensitive in that way, but we don't have showers. Mm -hmm. That will be changed by the end of this year because we will have two accessible showers that will be put in and then of course we've had accessible toilet and sink to go along with that. And then also there's a wellness and learning center that's adjacent to that. So it's really exciting time for us in terms of expanding because we want to make sure we anchor down that bottom layer of that Maslow's hierarchy of need. Um, and then our second, another core strategy is to nurture a community that is invested in treating people humanely. And that's why, you know, I happened to stumble on Kimberly actually advertised because, you know, the person who was supposed to present today couldn't present. And I saw it in a neighborhood blog and I contacted her and said, hey, you know, we like the opportunities like this. I, I welcome opportunities like this to come out and talk about what, what your perceived needs are and what questions you have about what's going on with our needs. And so I called her contact her and said, if you'd like, you know, we, we would be happy to come. And then, and then, Poor Michelle, who just she came into the house. Me. I said, <laughs> me into it. you know, gosh, you know, it's only like got a few days to figure this out. So, would you, by any chance, be willing to come and share a piece of your story about homelessness and, and how your journey with that? And um, so, I'm going to pass my baton. Um, I do have some brochures over there. So, the one thing I want to say at this point, and I'll say it again later. One, I have cards. If anyone wants a card, you know, you're welcome to email me. Um, I would invite anybody here to come visit our day center um, and, and, and come in for a tour. Anybody, come see what's happening. Because until, no matter what, people get an idea and then they come in, they're like, whoa, whoa. Sally Bagshaw came in a couple months ago and I said to her, okay Sally, she's one of our city council women. She's like, she is like a warrior. Yeah, I like her a lot. And then I came in and I said, I'm gonna take you downstairs and I'm not gonna apologize for anything you're about to see. Because you know we've got right now we don't have the staffing for people who are resting on mats to go into a separate area because we don't have staffing for that. But so so you know so it doesn't necessarily look pretty, but we are meeting people's needs where they need to be met. And she's like, all right, let's go. And so you know so that's I would welcome you all to come. Welcome to do, to contact me. Um, welcome to we're always looking for our volunteers. I am hiring right now. Um, do you have until Monday if you know someone who's looking for a uh, program manager position? Um, I'm hiring that and then next month in June, we actually going to be hiring another full-time position for um, our day center coordinator. So, now I've said my public, my PR thing, we have some brochures back there. Yes. Did you, I missed it at the beginning, did you say anything about children and children and all that? Well, thanks for saying that. I didn't say that. And then um, probably our sister, the way I look at it is our sister program in the city is Mary's Place, which is downtown. And they take women and children. We are just women, uh, anyone who identifies as female, we, that's, that's who we serve. And it's adult, age 18 and older. And, um, and so uh, one of the things that we find is that, um, well, that's another reason some folks come to us, they're like, you know, Mary's Place is fabulous. A little noisy because they have children, and so you know, so we don't have children, but we, you know, we certainly do a lot of referrals to Mary's Place. But thanks for asking that. So, yes. No, I don't want to inter interrupt what your next thing is. I just wanted to ask now. Um, at some time, is there going to be time for questions afterwards? Yes. Because I had a question almost right away, and I'm holding on, so you, know, you can do your thing. Why don't we? I like what you're asking. I like. I'm, I'm like that. You've got it in your mind. You're going to hold it. And so what I'm going to do though, just to for so Michelle gets a chance to tell her little piece, is she'll tell you. You know, I often think of stories are then and now, and so she'll tell a little story of you know of how she ended up finding herself homeless and then what's going on now. So and how you find out about EGH. So it's all oh, yeah. well, basically, um, nobody ever expects. I'm single mom, raised my son, worked two, three, four jobs. Um, always had to work, never had a chance to go to school. Uh, I 
I was very independent as a child, and I was a baby of five kids, and I said, my mom said, either go to school, work, go in the military, or leave home. And I went, I'm gonna go explore. So I worked as a waitress, and I figured that was one job you could do in any city in the country. You could go land a job as a waitress, and you could make your own. So I never saw beyond that, because I wanted to adventure and grow, and then all of a sudden I had a son. Hello. Then you raise your child, and then you do all these things, and all these things accumulate. And when he was 16, um, things happened, and he decided he didn't have to listen to mom anymore. So that <laughs> started the whole ball rolling. And when I found myself in this position, I had gotten hired on a job in North Dakota. North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And they had company housing, and they hired too many people. So I said, you're telling me that I sold my vehicle, I came a couple thousand miles away, promised housing to not have any housing. Mm -hmm. Now what? So it, it puts you in a position of, okay, what do we do now? And especially being female, I've always known homelessness is there. I've lived in big cities. I've lived in New York. I've lived in Phoenix and from California. And I've experienced it on a level of the observer. And until you're in it, um, and I'll say recently, what if Paltrow tried to live on food stamps for a month? Mm -hmm. She lasted a week. $29 a day, and she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. And she admitted it. She felt horrible. And she didn't realize that she thought people made it up. Oh, you get to X amount on your food stamps, you should be fine. Well, until you're actually faced with that reality, and you sit there and you go, what am I going to do? I'm not always going to. You take for granted you're going to be helping. I have a king. You take for granted you're going to have the ability to work and the ability to, ooh, I can go into any city and I can get a job. Doesn't happen. And I didn't bring a tissue. Um, <laughs> and so, it's part of the story. People see, oh, it's the drug, ad drug addict on the corner. It's the thing. It's the, um, the yeah, undereducated is the person who uh, comes from abuse, and all these things are true, but never before is there a time where people are one paycheck away. And it's a proven fact. And you can look it up online. Like, I think it's up to 65% of the nation's population is one paycheck away from being home. So, um, you know, Michelle's just telling the truth from her heart here. And so I know a little bit about her story because we talked a lot in the last week. And, and so when she passed at that board, all of a sudden here she was. She was in Tacoma, correct? And there was no job. And she decided, and actually being the youngest of five, her mother said, come home, come home. And she decided, no, you know, I, I really need to figure this out myself, for myself. And so she got into the shelter system. And sometimes the first stop um, for those folks that live in this geographic area is Ambulance, <coughs> which is managed by the YWCA down, um, down on, on down <coughs> downtown. And so that's, that's the usual first stop, and that's where there's a woman's resource. They, she'll, her, her and acronyms um, are, is that the right word? Acronym. 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 Uh, is, you know, WRC, and that's the Women's Resource Center. And that's where, you know, you go and you get in line and you get assigned to a shelter for the night. And, um, and then you're in a whole new system. Mm -hmm. And most of those shelters are managed by a, a, uh, an organization called Share Wheel. And, 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 and so that was. No, actually, that's not, that, no, that's not right. Okay. okay. Oh, she's taking over. I'm taking over. Okay, I took it away. Um, okay, there's different groups. There's Catholic Community Services that work with uh, WRC. And they actually have a group of about uh, 10 spaces that they can ship women off to. 
Um, then you've got Shared Wheel, which is the politically involved group. This is another group that you can, I was with them for over a year. Um, I started to become involved with the political organization, working with city council, working with um, city government, county government, state level. Uh, we do the Occupy movement, they work with SAFE. Um, they are the people who stand in front of houses and refuse to let people get evicted. Um, they get arrested, they get put on the news, they, all these things. They fight the government system that wants to hold people back in that aspect. Um, and it's a really good thing, it can be. Um, but what people don't understand that Share Wheel alone holds over 550 people, men and women, a night in 10 different shelters. And that's not even what CCS does. I don't even know what CCS's numbers are. But CCS is Catholic Community or, Services. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm just going to interpret yeah. for her. And I, I don't, know, I don't even know what their numbers are. Their, their numbers, they've got the YWCA, they've got um, Lazarus's Place, they've got of course, they've got uh, you know Mary's Place. They have um, Sacred Heart, which is a well, no, that's to share there. Um, Julius. There's uh, Julius. Jubilee. Okay. There is Jubilee is not, not a shelter. Um, so, so tell a little bit about. Um, so you ended up in a shelter. Ended up in the shelter system. Started working with Sherwell. I uh, started to learn a lot about how the politics of health work, and it's amazing how little they give a crap government, city, the people up there, the people who run this the city and the state. Really, we have, it personally with Cher, we are $70,000 in debt. And I still say we because I still am a part of the community. Um, I worked heavily with them uh, for over a year. Um, you get involved with the meetings, you go to Occupy movements, I've been to three of them. I've helped put on two of them so far. My first one I was an observer. Scared to death, going, I'm in over my head. Second one, they said, come on, you're gonna help. I went, oh great. Then you get involved and then you're like, this is absolutely ridiculous. They promised you funding, they run you around in circles. Oh, you gotta do this, oh, you gotta do this. Oh, we won't really help you. They're blowing smoke out their asses and I'm being very blunt by this because they say one thing, but their actions are something else. Mm -hmm. They don't realize the need if they do, they're blind to it because unless they're in it, and, and I tell everybody, if you want to get a job as an advocate, be homeless for a month. And somebody was telling me, oh, that's real unrealistic to do it. I said, no, I'm serious. Until you're in the shoes of that person, and you're sitting across from them, and you're sitting there going, I've been where you are. I understand what you're going through. You have no idea what that person has come through. See, a girl got shot in the face seven times down in front of McDonald's, downtown last month. Over a drug deal gone bad. Another guy got shot the month before, right downtown. And people, oh, it's just a hopeless person. Like, they don't matter. And that's not the case. So we had a guy, a girl who was stabbed um, in, in, in a supposedly safe encampment that the city approved. But they had no security. Nobody gives a they don't care that the people that don't have, they want to make it harder and harder and harder for people, and they don't realize the number is increasing and growing and growing. And it, it gets you to the point where can't they just see? But they have blinders on, and they don't, oh, we, they don't realize there's sub-communities beneath their very existence. You're walking down the street, all you see is homeless guys. You don't realize he's part of a community. It's a whole nother world that people don't see. There's that, they see homelessness, but they don't realize in that environment, there's subcultures within that culture. Mm -hmm. And it's a disease, and they don't look at it as a disease. There can be a cure if people gave a crap and really actually when we elect people into office and we have a councilwoman actually a councilman uh, oh crap his name escapes me out but there was just a battle in city hall um, in the county council and they promised us $150,000 because 
we have it in our contract system. We cannot hold open a shelter, wheel shelter unless we provide bus tickets. This is just a small part of the battle that we face. $150,000 to be divided between 15 shelters, and that's not including, that's money, DSC takes a big chunk of that because of business organizations. And, and that's yes. downtown emergency services. 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 Yeah, and they take a huge chunk of that because they're the mm -hmm. largest. Well, what they don't understand is that we house 550 people a night, every night, with share wheel. And just in the women's shelter alone, which is the emergency, no, no requirement, you just show up and they'll house you, they average 50, six to 65 women a night, just in that one building. And- so I'm gonna, I'm and gonna stop you just one second. Oh, I, let me just finish okay, this point, though, because this is important, because the battle we're facing is that they put in the contract, in order to hold a shelter open, you must provide tickets for the bus, for the people to and from. But what they do is they sit there and they go, oh, well, we have a problem distributing the funds for you to get those tickets. And then Metro will sit there and go, oh, well, wait a minute, they're not printed. So these people are sitting there running you in circles going up until the last minute where two years in a row we've been forced with closures. So you've got 550 extra people out on the street. And the last time this happened, they were in two weeks in front of City Hall, sleeping every night until the City Council finally said, oh, maybe we do need to give them what the, we promised them. And basically, it's a matter of them keeping their word. So this is a battle that homelessness faces is because you've got bureaucracy not realizing the very real need that the numbers are growing, they're not going away. And they think, they, they sugarcoat it and say, oh, well, it's only 5,000 people in a city of how many hundreds of thousands or a million or whatever the number may be. That's still 5,000 people on the street. That shouldn't be when you've got abandoned buildings. You've got buildings that you could easily convert into some kind of housing that they're letting sit empty instead. So, so thank you. And, um, and so it's, it's, uh, it, what's kind of awesome since, you know, Michelle and I are just getting to know each other and is that, you know, what I, I guess my, um, I don't, I don't want to come sounding as a Pollyanna, but I really do have a lot of faith that, that it's really, you know, our government is going to be part of, it has to be part of the solution, and how we approach them has got to be, you know, in a unified sort of way, which I think starts from every level. And, you know, you're doing a ch champion job of, of advocacy from, you know, from the ground floor up, and that there's clearly a disconnect. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about that Michelle said that she and I have talked about is, the subculture, and um, and that that's really you know often people get their needs met by you know by communicating about what's going on within the, the subculture. And one of the things I've learned from working at Elizabeth Gregory Home over the last several years is that you know it's it's um, there's a human nature part of this where you know there's the haves and the have-nots, and that happens even within this particular culture. But um, but the, but everybody has the same essential human needs. I think that that's where we have to kind of look at, you know, um, and I think that's what the advocacy of Share Real and Have Community Services, Elizabeth Gregory Home, and I, I, I believe, because I am an optimist, that, you know, at the, at the heart of it is, you know, government is all of us, it's people who comprise our government, and that we really do, we want the best, but we have to figure out how to create that best. And uh, so I think those are the open conversations that I hope come from meetings like this, and, um, and that, Getting involved in any small way is significant, and so you know when people come, we have folks who've been signing up. You know, we have three three month three Mondays of the month. Our food supplies <coughs> are often low after the weekends uh, because our last food delivery is on today on Thursday. Um, so we've had people who who deliver food for us either either they make sandwiches or they bring us food for sandwiches. So Monday and Tuesday people have more food. You know, like those simple ways are significant ways that people. Can Involved. So if you think like, oh, there's the homeless problem, you know, government isn't going to solve it. They can only be part of the solution, and the rest of it is up to us. So that's, that's all I'm going to say.
No, the other thing I was going to bring up, if people are doing something, there is a, I just brought it to my attention, there is a lady, and I wish I could have printed it out, um, she had designed a jacket that could double as a sleeping bag for mm -hmm. homeless people, and then she's going viral with it on Facebook, it's fabulous, and she had, was, had taken them down to some homeless people, and um, the community said, well, these are all good and well, but we don't need sleeping bags, we need jobs, and so, she restructured her company and will only hire homeless people to work. Mm -hmm. So it's actions of people that will help make things better and actually give people a sense of hope and a sense of dignity. I think that's. Mm -hmm. uh, see, you mentioned something about 5,000 uh, homeless in, in Seattle, uh, sitting roughly half a million people that just struck me. Uh, that's similar to the incarceration rate nat nationally. About two and a half million in 325 million. And if you think about it, they are in a self-imposed prison because they don't see a way out of it. I recently, th thank you very much, both of you, but thank you very much for sharing your story. And um, I'm just gonna comment on one piece, and I realize there, there are many facets of homelessness. Um, <clears throat> the uh, When you mentioned affordable housing, I just recently learned, I was talking to somebody who said they were in affordable housing, and so I was asking questions. And the different, I thought affordable housing was low income, and there are two very distinct differences. <laughs> and this whole affordable housing thing, which I don't know all the details, but I'm, I know a young woman who's my daughter's friend was, um, and had a job as an architect, so she wasn't you know, uh, hand to mouth or anything. She was in an affordable apartment in a really nice, new, gorgeous building down in South Lake Union. And so when talking to somebody afterwards, I found out that, um, I, well, I don't know the details of what the deal is for the builders, but the builders get some kind of deal for having, and a lot of that kind of stuff is going on. I and mean, we need more low-income housing. And I know the waiting lists for low-income housing are years, years long, at least five years, I think. Um, and you know, I look around and I see all the building that's going on in this city. And um, and I know, you know, one isn't necessarily a trade-off for the other. I mean, those are people who, you know, own their property and they decide they're going to build on it. And that's part of our, you know, system of democracy. People can do what they want, but. Um, but I, I know that there are deals going on that these people are getting. You know, you put in a certain amount of retail and you don't have to have parking spaces and you know, and then you get put in a little affordable housing and you get some 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 perks and um, it, it's just criminal in my opinion. We we've, we've got to be um, well I know I'm speaking preaching to the choir, but <laughs> I guess my point is I was just shocked when I heard about this distinct difference between affordable and low income and the affordable there are a lot of people who can really afford an apartment who don't need to be in an apartment building in South Lake Union. Um, so it's it's a big problem in terms of you know just having housing, adequate housing for people who live in the city. <coughs> well, I, that's another thing as far as like the, you know the working wage. Uh, California was trying to do for a while the working wage, and it ended up not working out very well. Um, because mm -hmm. their homeless rate went up because we, when they did that, and I tried to warn people about when they're harping on, oh, we need the 15 an hour, we need the 15 an hour, and I said, look what happened in California. I said, you don't know what you're doing. And I, having come from there and saw what it did, basically everything else went up. When the yeah. wage went up, the economy went up. You had the rate hikes in the water, gas, utilities. You had the rate hikes in the rent. You had the rate in the the, 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 the delivery of everything and so when they talk about that here and as far as you know how do you work it with the housing you need to find that balance and that's the, the hardest thing is when you become unbalanced it's almost impossible to fix because you're going to end up the only way you can afford it if you work downtown you're going to commute because unless you've got a really good job you're not going to be able to afford to live downtown which would be easier to get to work. I know many people who live in Tacoma and commute up here every day because they just cannot afford to live up here. And that's one thing we're faced with when, when I'm looking and thinking, of, where am I gonna go from here? And then, you know, I'm thinking, I got up to two years to figure it all out. Am I gonna have to go down to Tacoma 
find a place and commute back and forth. It, I want to go to school. I'm going to go to school here, but I'm not going to be able to afford to live here. So I'm going to have to figure that's a whole other issue. And when you're looking at people trying to make it, well, I know that, but I mean, it's like those are decisions you have to make when you're moving in. So many people go, oh, the pay here is fabulous. Let's go to Seattle. Then they get here and go, oh my gosh, I'm that's what makes people one step away from homelessness that come up here and don't realize how much it costs to live up here. And it's a scary thing. And, but then again, you've got people who come up here because of the services and go, this is a great place to be homeless because you get so much. So there's both of those paradoxes that you've got to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I could probably talk for, for about 30 minutes, but I wasn't here to, to lead the conversation. But, you know, I guess um, that's one thing I was really curious about. My question was originally, as soon as we have all these things, like this new minimum wage, you know, and then we also um, let marijuana be legal, and we have all these things that other people want to move to Washington or Seattle for, all of a sudden there's all these new people that have to come find a place to live. Because a lot of people don't get to have marijuana legal. A lot of people don't get to have this high wage. And so they come from other states. And that's, okay, it's just my theory. I can't speak, I mean, I haven't done a study. But it seems to me that could be one of the problems is, is the more we make Seattle a place that people want to move to, there's be more people moving here that aren't going to be able to find a place right away. I mean, and, and, and all of these new ones are more for glamour. But you know, and, and, and not just a, a safe place to live. But like what she was saying there, um, because I studied some real estate um, at a community college, I found out that one of the things these developers have to do, they're required by law, and you can look up the law probably if you know how to look up RCWs, they're, re they're required by law to provide a certain amount of low income housing for every development. But in our class, we didn't study enough about what that percentage was. So Wait, I don't, I'm not affordable. Well, they didn't call it low income they in class. But the thing is, I checked out one of the buildings here also because I was curious. Um, I mean, I just wanted to see what it was like. And, and then <clears throat> she asked me, since it was a brand new building, she said, are you by any chance one of the people who has any of the low income housing um, you know, benefits? And I actually wasn't. I've never had Section 8 or anything. Um, I've just only had food stamps. So um, when she asked me this, I said, well, why? Why is that something that you're asking me? She said, well, because we um, have to set aside uh, some of the units for low-income people. But like she said, some of these low-income people, like maybe it, the person you know, since she's just beginning as an architect, she's considered low-income because she's getting started, right? Uh, yeah, but no you know, I mean, what they consider low-income, so then you have to define what is low-income, mm -hmm. you know? What is affordable? Now, affordable is, uh, you know, usually they say that you want to have three times your uh, rent money for income. That's because then you can afford other things. So, so that to me, that's what affordable means. But when you're low income, it's like me. The last few years, I've been living on five hundred thirty-five dollars a month plus food stamps, and then five twenty-six dollars is my rent. And it's great. Yeah, it's true. I have low rent, but I've been there thirty years. You know, so it's not like I just moved into town. But you know, now I just got a big rent hike, and so and now I'm the person who's freaking. But I'm not freaking too bad yet. But you know, it's just still something weird because I think it's all these people moving in because of the benefits of getting, you know, pot being legal, fifteen dollar wage eventually for everybody. And then, yeah, every and what other cities are, are making homelessness an issue? I mean, that's the other thing. Is this happening in other cities? And so everybody here is well, you know, if you can go to Seattle and they'll take care of the homeless, let's go because you know we might as well be taken care of too. I mean, no, so this is the issue. It's like, what are the other cities and states doing to help balance out everybody from not moving here? That's my question. Yeah, I, when I first came in, I heard you saying that the tenant plan and homelessness has failed, but in effect, it's probably succeeded too well, and that it's attracted a lot of people here who are, who are homeless to get the services that are working well. So we need to do more yeah, of this. There's just more of them coming in. Well, as far as the people moving here, I, I would take issue with your your um, premise. <laughs> I think that yes. yes, I know that this you know we see more people in the streets because the weather is nice. You know, more people living on the streets because the weather is nicer than it is in other places. But I think the influx and the reason for all these buildings that are going to be filled, these apartment buildings, is because Amazon and some of the other big companies are bringing thousands of workers here. 
And I say we need a state income tax and tax these people mm -hmm. who are making really nice salaries to provide services for yeah. our city, yeah. our, our state. Because yeah, we don't have enough money to yeah. provide services. There's been a lot of studies and there really hasn't, although there can be that perception, there really has not been a huge influx of homeless people because we are the, the mecca of providing you know, home this is, I, I, I work in the social and you know, with social and human services students, and one of them had done a, a big research project, yeah. and that was their conclusion. So yeah. they give them credit. For it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Um, and this might help everybody. Um, in the past, when I went to a Seattle City Council meeting, you know, you can go to those. You can find out when they're happening, and all the people who represent all the districts. You know, they usually have a, an agenda. And I think if you get there by a certain period of time, ahead of time, you can put something on the agenda that they have to listen to. So all of the citizens can go to the Seattle City Council meetings and have these things heard. Like, you know, you can go. Share that. And, okay, and you know, but I mean, a lot of people could tell their friends to go. And, I mean, not that you can manipulate the whole thing, like, you know, it seems like I'm doing right now. But you know, I mean, you know, it, 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 as long as people go regularly and say this is happening and I want this well, looked at. Probably more effectively than going to a meeting is to write and to call you know, your district representatives. That's really the best way because then they can go and you know and either come talk to you or present to class. Um, I was thinking about what you said about um, the uh, the success of the ten-year plan, and so I want to just you know, reframe it because what they did, what, what the focus of the ending of the 10-year plan is if we build it, you know, and so there's a lot of focus and so there was a lot of low-income housing that was built, which was is a huge success. What they, what they're now starting to reconsider, <coughs> and I'm grateful for that because it's what I was saying at the very beginning is, you know, building, building places for people to live is one part of the solution mm -hmm. and creating um, opportunities for people to gain skills and to learn about uh, resources and doing things like you know so that you know they, they were essentially looking at cutting out any kind of support services such as a drop-in day center there is a need for that right and, and one of the systems that did fill that need um, because again of funding cuts is libraries because not a lot of people who, who are homeless that is a place that they can feel like they can be part of so there's the inclusion uh, there are restrooms to use, yay, and that they and that they um, also can enrich their lives, you know, by accessing internet as well as as you know books and quiet. It's quiet, but you know, then all of a sudden, you know, remember at one point they were knocking out, you know, like most libraries being open, but you know, many of them cut back hours and such. And so, you know, there's so many systemic problems where people do need places to replenish, renew, and to gain skills and to and to move forward. And so that's one of the things that they're reconsidering is. You know, you can build these buildings that are, you know, exclusively low-income folks, and then a lot of them go in there and are like, whoa, you know, hey, you know, I haven't lived. And that's one of the things we find out in our, our transitional housing program. You know, you bring in people from all these different walks of life, like some of the buildings that are just exclusively low-income, and suddenly you have a lot of people who are going, you know, who, who really didn't have adequate support systems and still don't have adequate support systems. And, you know, and so, you know, so you need to have the in-between um, places that are the networks that, that, that you know catch. So it's very complex, that's what I would say. There's not an easy fix to this, but we can all approach it from that same core, my belief is, the human dignity of each person, and that everybody, you know, deserves to be seen, respected, included, and belong. I will say that I don't think this will ever go away, and that from what I've seen, it is getting worse. And when you've got so many people living paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth, one step away, if there is much more crashing in our economy, it's going to be epidemic proportion. And this is where we, if we can look at the things that are in place now, you've got groups like Elizabeth Reagan, you've got groups like Cherville that try to work with the politicians, try to do things on a grassroot level if people work together and say that we can do it as a community and give people jobs and hopes and retraining. And like for me, I'm 48 years old, going, I got diagnosed with osteosporosis in both hips and lower back in my left knee last year. Years of working on my feet and killing myself, raising a job. Your body changes, you change as you get older. If we can find a way to easily adjust that and say, 
let's refocus you. Okay, now you can go in this direction. You can do this. We can retrain you for this. You can help in this way. Um, get people involved in a community as far as working together and helping each other um, agriculturally, learning, get community gardens, get people having a sense of togetherness, not the me mentality, but more of a, I'm gonna help you to help me, and we're gonna help each other, and make it more of a group effort than a singular effort. Some of my students come out to Alaska as a success program. I don't know the reference to give you, but your students found somebody else can find it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just, oh, go ahead. I was just uh, wanted to pose a question to the group of, if anybody's been following what's been happening in Utah, and if that's still deemed successful or not, because for those that are unfamiliar, they essentially um, found, I think got, last I heard, got rid of 75% of the chronic homeless issue, mm -hmm. because they gave everybody a home and a social worker and counseling and support in that way, and they found it was actually more cost effective. Um, so I don't know what the long-term effects of that have They weren't doing that when I was there. So yeah. it must have happened after I left. It is, it is. <laughs> and I think that that's exactly, you know, I I, I just, you know, have a, a personal philosophy of, of instead of, you know, you know focusing on what's working, look at what's working. And, yeah. and I think that definitely Utah is, is a great example where, you know, the community and, and government, you know, pulled together and came up with some solutions. And, you know, it was a, it's a smaller scale, you know, um, where, where it happened, but I think it's highly effective. And so I think that, you know, we have to look at what's working. And, um, and I think they're just amazing, beautiful community programs that are also working um, to address the, the basic needs. There's teen feed, you know, that you know, meets like a university district. You know, teenagers on the streets can have a, a meal, a warm meal every night. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of programs that are very effective and working. And I, so I'm, I, I agree. I, do I know the statistics? No, but that's what we need to do. We need to look at what's working. Thanks for bringing that up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I have to come back again in the future. Yeah, you know, you can talk about it for hours. You know, because there's really a lot of, you know, we're all excited in the neighborhood, so I'm sure a lot of people I see lined up along Broadway. And I always feel so bad, because I know what it was like when I was on the phone. And I know, I know how I felt. Luckily that didn't happen, but then when I see these people and I see how long they've been out there and I'm just yeah, like, God, well, I can say hi to them, but I feel stupid because here I am saying hi and so I'm helping them, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving them what they think. Well, and I'm, I'm not giving them anybody don't need a pen. Don't sit in your seat. I'm not giving them a pen. 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 Just somebody not talking down to you. And it was interesting because people were like, well, you don't look homeless. Well, sorry I'm not ratty enough for you, but it doesn't belay the fact that, yes, I, I live in a shelter. And they're like, but you don't look homeless. I said, well, okay, is there a way? I should look to appease you. I'm keeping my dignity, but, but a lot of times what it is, if I find there's some great groups, there's a, a feed that happens. Um, they they do different points of the season, but I noticed the people that run it, the one thing that I've seen them do, and they treat each person with respect. They take the time to learn each person's name, and they will come to you. If they don't go the one week, by the next week, they make a point of remembering your name. So you don't feel like a faceless, yeah. uh, I'm an enigma, I don't matter, but uh, you come in, hey Michelle, how are you doing? And they make it a point to include you. And so even though you don't think that you're I'm not doing. I'm not getting him five dollars to go get a meal. I'm not. I'm not contributing. A kind word goes huge. You have no idea what that does. Mm -hmm. Even just a casual greeting. Even just a, how are you doing today? You oh, know, it's know. something. It's giving them a I chance. It's really bad because I do that all the time, and actually, you know, I just feel sort of like, um, you know, maybe I am sort of feeling a little bit guilty that I'm not sticking my neck out more by, you know, going go to the city council meetings, you know, or, or well, doing something. Maybe that'll inspire you to go into another direction. I mean, but actually, I'm looking for work, so that's right. Well, I know, but, but I, I have to think of myself you know, first. You know, I have to think of myself first, and now that I got this rent raise, I really do have to. But know. any little thing, don't undermine, and 
any little act of kindness is when you become, when you realize this situation and you realize you're in it. And when I, when I started and I started working with Sheer Whale and I was like, how am I doing? Doesn't even matter. Doesn't even. And then they said, okay, well we want you to help with Occupy. I'm like, I don't know nothing about it. What do I do? Then you start getting involved in like each action of each person matters. What you do and how you get that issue out there that it is a problem, it is an epidemic, it is a huge proportion. If each person, it's like a grain of seed, it's each person, each person, and it becomes, it's like I talk about it now on my Facebook page. I used to be kind of close about it, I didn't want everybody to know my business. Oh, you poor thing, you were homeless. Now I get more people admitting, you know what, last year from the year in my car, nobody knew it. Last, last month I was freaking out because I was gonna lose my car. People aren't as ashamed to say, it's not like it used to be. We're not in the land of plenty anymore. It's hard. It's hard to get those ends meet. But if you have that support system of people just being honest, just being real, just saying, you know what? It's hard. It's what do you need? What what can I help you with? Let's help each other. Let's do. Oh, you need a ride to work here. Let me get you a bus stop and let me get you help each other out instead of putting each other down and saying, well, I'm better than you. We're all in it together. It's not any. Or no better than anybody else. Once you get into that system, you're all the same. And we all need to uplift it instead of bring each other down. So any little small act of kindness, don't under don't underestimate it. You don't know how bad a day that person has. And just for you to smile and say, hey, how are you doing? You actually yes. in, included them and made them feel good. Yeah, Even if it was just for a second. Yeah, it's just it's been going on for so long. Yeah. Yeah.